What can you give in exchange for life? I guess this question will no doubt be especially important for someone who is facing death and is hoping to avoid death. We give something for something in our everyday lives. For example, we pay money to our mechanics to maintain our car or to repair our car. We use our money to buy our daily necessities. We can give of other things like our time and our effort, for example, to gain knowledge, to gain health when we try very hard to keep healthy, to exercise, etc., or to close a sale if you are doing some business. But there are some things that all the money and all the efforts and all the determination of this world will never be able to get us. Like in the case of this great man, Naaman. Naaman who lived about 850 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's around 900 BC to 850 BC where this man lived. This man, Naaman, as the Bible records for us, was the commander-in-chief of the Syrian army at that time. He was known to be a, a brave man and a great warrior who had achieved great successes on the battlefield for Syria. And thus, I'm sure, the king would have richly rewarded him and therefore he must also have been a great, a great in riches. In other words, Naaman was someone who had great power, great riches, great fame and honour. Everything that a man would desire to have, Naaman had them. But verse 1 tells us this great Naaman also had a great problem, which nobody wants. He had leprosy. And we know it doesn't matter if a person is rich or poor, wise or foolish, no one, no one can escape or no one is beyond the reach of sicknesses and even death. And Naaman is no exception. He had leprosy. Leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, is a chronic progressive bacterial infection caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium leprae. Well, I googled this, so I learned this from Dr. Google. And uh, leprosy produces skin ulcers, nerve damage, and muscle weakness. If it isn't treated early, it can cause severe disfigurement and significant disability to a person. And so we know often because the patient has no feeling of pain and therefore they would not notice that they have hurt themselves or they have burned themselves and that further aggravates the problem and cause the, the skin to, to be infected, cause his condition to worsen until basically the patient would rot till he dies. Although today, with early diagnosis and treatment, leprosy can be cured, but during the Old Testament times, it was an incurable disease. In fact, leprosy was often a sign of God's judgment in biblical times, which nobody could heal except God. Leprosy represents sin. Because of its hideous and revolting nature that eats up a person alive in that sense. And so I suppose when Naaman found patches of rash like thing and ulcers breaking up on his skin that didn't seem to heal but got worse, the doctors would have told him that he had contracted leprosy. And that would amount to a death sentence to him, wouldn't it? It is like someone being told by the doctor, your cancer is at its fourth stage or, or, or latest stage where nothing medically 
nothing else medically we can do for you. You just wait for your time to come. At that time, when you contract leprosy, that's like a death sentence. You just wait to rot till you die. Perhaps during that time, there, there were also many others who had leprosy in Syria. But they have received little attention. In fact, they probably would have been separated from the people, much like the people in Israel. If any Jewish people had leprosy, they were not allowed into the temple of God. They were not allowed to get close to anybody. A bit like our non-vax people today. You're not allowed to uh, go eat at the hawker centre and uh, enter into the shopping malls. But because of Naaman's high position and riches and connections, he would have been able to get to reach all kinds of means of, of treatment to, to find out who would be able to help him to get a cure for him. But that's natural because of the self-preservation instinct that is in every man who wants to live. We, when we know that we have something serious, we will want to find a solution. Right? Because for Naaman, what would be the world to him without his health? As we always said, health is wealth. If he can have all the wealth, all the power, if he was going to die, he would not be able to enjoy any of them. And even if he were to spend all his fortune, if he could get a cure, I'm sure he would be willing to do so. Recently, I read a report of a Singapore boy who had a certain condition where only this medication, which is the most expensive medication in the world, uh, could cure him. And it costs about close to $3 million. And uh, because of public funding, he, he got that medication and thankfully it worked and he could now move a little with some aid. But for Naaman, with all the money that he, he had and all the power, there was no cure for him. And no one can take his place even if, if they were willing to be the substitute. He had to bear this this leprosy himself. What probably had started as a small spot on his skin was beginning to spread all over his body, turning into ulcers and eating deeper and deeper into him. And every day he was growing more hideous, more smelly from the rotting flesh and, and he knew his days are numbered and he became more and more desperate to find a cure. And in his desperation, he was even willing to try what his wife's maid had suggested to him. Even though this was but a little Jewish girl, this young Jewish girl was taken captive in one of Syria's raid into Israel. So you can imagine this girl was actually torn apart from, his, from her family, Maybe her parents were even killed during that raid, taken away, robbed of her freedom, brought into a foreign land to serve, to serve the wife of her enemy's chief commander. Yet this little girl, on knowing that the masters, the the master Naaman, had this leprosy. She wasn't rejoicing. Like, good, this is your reputate, uh, retribution. You did all these things to, to the people of Israel. You should die. No. Instead, she cared for him. And she suggested, or rather she not just simply suggested, she wished if she could make her master go to Israel, look for the prophet of God because she knew that only God could heal. And therefore, she had wanted the master to go see the prophet of God. She cared for her master. So Naaman, in his desperation, was willing to trust what this little girl said. He went to the king and told the king what this maid said. 
And the king also would like to try that because this is his right, right hand man, very important man. And if there is a way, let's try it. And he said in verse 5, Go, go, I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And so Naaman departed and we were told he took along with him 10 talents of silver. That's a lot of silver. And 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 changes of raiment. 6,000 pieces, I'm not sure how big each piece of those gold were, but even if it was like a, a gold nugget, 6,000 pieces of gold nuggets plus the silver would probably be at least in today's value, two, three million dollars. He probably must be thinking to himself, you know, if nobody can heal and this prophet could heal me, then it must probably cost a lot of money. But I don't care if he could heal me, all the money I'm willing to pay. So we find Naaman going, instead of to the prophet, he went first to the king. Sometimes again, that kind of thinking, that connection, go to the king and then maybe the king will command the prophet to come and heal me. He went to the king and showed to the king the letter which the king of Syria wrote, demanding or rather asking that Naaman be healed of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read that letter, he rent his clothes. He was so scared. He, he, he told the people around him, he said, look, this guy is looking for trouble. I am not God. How am I supposed to heal this man of leprosy? And so he was very scared and troubled. But when the prophet Elisha heard about it, he sent a messenger to rebuke the king that he had forgotten that there is a true and living God in Israel. And he told the king to send Naaman to him. So Naaman went from the palace to the doors of Elisha with all his company of horses and men and chariot and you can imagine it's not every day that such dignitaries or such great men would visit the prophet Elisha. So at that time, most likely everyone living in the area would have noticed that there is this big, big train of horses and, and men that from Syria coming to Elisha's house. They would have gathered around the house to, to try and observe what was going to happen. And when they were at the house, this great Naaman did not come down from his horse to plead for the prophet to help him. But we can imagine the reason is because he was so accustomed to all the pomp and all the honour that others would show to him that it would be people who would kowtow to him and, and not him to back anybody. So he sat on expecting for the prophet Elisha to come out to meet him. Maybe thinking to himself, Elisha should feel honoured that I would even come to this, this little house of his. Yeah. But Elisha didn't come out of his house to flatter his vain pride. Instead, Elisha wants Naaman to humble himself to know that all his money, all his horses and power has nothing to do and cannot do anything to heal his leprosy. Instead, Elisha sent a messenger to tell Naaman in verse 10, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall come again to you, and you shall be clean. That infuriated Naaman. To him, the prophet not coming to meet him was already an insult. Now the method of healing was the greatest insult of all to him. Verse 11 tells us, Naaman was raw and he went away. You can imagine when he heard that, he told his men, let's go back. I don't want to see this man anymore. Let's go, let's go. And he said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He thought, what Elisha should do, he thought the method of healing should be that the prophet should come out, call upon God, 
call on God, examine me. And then maybe wave his hand over my, my wounds and, and then I will be healed. So he, he thought that would be a reasonable way of, of healing my leprosy. In fact, he was also thinking, go wash in the river of Jordan. Verse 12, he said, are not Abana and Papa rivers of Damascus, rivers in his own Syrian land, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? That's ridiculous. Is this prophet trying to make a fool of me? Ask me to go and wash in that dirty water in Jordan and then when I'm not healed, come back and everyone will be laughing at me. Let's go back. He wants to go home without being healed. Naaman, even in his desperate state, did not understand the depravity of his heart. He was too concerned of his own honour. He wasn't even thinking that the healing must come only from the Almighty God and he thought God is here to serve him even. He has forgotten that this instruction to go to Jordan, which is a river in Israel, belongs to God. And more importantly, this is an instruction from God for him to get healed. But Naaman's thinking may be like many of us. He didn't like God's way of salvation. He didn't like that there is only one way to River Jordan. Why can't I wash in other rivers? And he said, I thought. I thought the way, the way to be healed is like that and like that. This I thought can kill many people. You know, when I was in the army, if someone were to make a mistake, and then in explaining to the superior, say, I thought, you're going to get a greater scolding. You thought. You're supposed to ensure what you thought. Your I thought can kill the whole company. Your I thought, you know, as you're driving, you cannot say, I thought nobody will run across the road. You thought. But because you thought and somebody ran across the road and you killed that person, you will still be charged. You cannot go and tell the judge, I thought. Naaman say, I thought. I thought that's the way to be healed. And he refused to accept God's way of healing. How often, how often we are like that too. I thought, in order to be right with God, I just need to be good. Just don't do bad things to others. I thought God should be happy with me. Look at the many good things that I've done. Look at all the praises that people give to me. I'm really not a bad person. I thought. But that's what you thought. God's way is different. God's way of saving is different. Naaman was prepared to go the difficult way, was prepared to do great things, was prepared to pay great price. If the instruction was for him to use his bare hand to go kill a lion, he would most likely go because he was a brave man to climb the highest mountain. He would do it. But no, he was told that there's nothing you can do. The only thing is to humble yourself and to go to the River Jordan because that represents God's healing. Go there and wash yourself and you'll be healed. Just that simple. It's that simple. Also, for all sinners to have their sins cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. How? By faith, go to Him in repentance. By faith, Believe that he is the saviour that God has sent to die on the cross some 2,000 years ago in order to pay for the sins of all those who trust in him. Just believe. You don't have to bring your money. You don't have to bring any good works. It's just by faith. But many will not like these kind of answers. My, my aunties had many discussions with me and they, they had said things like, 
so easy. Just believe and you can go to heaven. Just believe and your sins are forgiven. How can it be? That's too simple. That's too simple. But that's something that you and I can never do. Sincerely. Unless God works in our hearts. Ask yourself, who would like to go to hell? Who would not want to go to heaven? But the way to, to, to achieve that is only when your sins are forgiven, when you by faith believe in Christ. Would you do that? Can you sincerely do that? When we say believe, it is not just intellectually or just with your mouth say, okay, I believe, so now God is going to bring me to heaven. No, of course not. Believe is to give your whole life to God like Naaman who had to humble himself, go by God's way to the river, bend his knee, dip himself in the water and wash himself. Is it the water that, that cured him? No, it, it was God who cured him. And so it's the same way when the gospel comes to us, it tells us that there is only one way. That is true, the Saviour Jesus Christ, whom God has sent. And it is not by us doing good works, but it is by us trusting wholeheartedly to Him. That simplicity of the gospel comes through so beautifully in an Old Testament text also in Isaiah 55, verse 1 to 3, where the Word of God says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, that are thirsty, Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come and buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Buy without your money, without your price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken, listen diligently unto me, and eat Ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. You know, the best things in life are really priceless, isn't it? If you can put a price to something, this thing has a price to it. Salvation is not something we can put a price to it. Something we can pay with money, effort, whatever you have. No, all the world, even if you can give will never buy you salvation, will never buy you forgiveness for your sins from God. And therefore, the only way is to come by faith. The only way for Naaman to be healed is by faith, belief in what God says through his prophet. But Naaman was angry and he turned away, ignoring his great need. He said, I'd rather not be healed. Almost saying that, right? Let's go back. So, it's the same. There are people who say, oh, to be saved, I need to submit myself to Christ, follow Him. I'd rather not be saved. Yeah, that's just being foolish to not know what the end thereof for those who are still in their sins. But thankfully, he had some good men with him who urged him that wouldn't you do, do, the, do it if, if the prophet were to tell you to do something difficult? Now he's asking you to do something simple. Why don't you do it? Thankfully, he was won over by their reasonings and he went to bathe himself and indeed, he was healed. The Bible tells us his flesh, destroyed by leprosy, his flesh came again like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Through this exercise of his faith, faith not just believing, but faith taking action to really go to the river to wash, he was completely healed. Healed not only physically, but more importantly in his soul. He was healed and now he was reconciled to the true God, his creator, the God to whom he belongs, and now he wants to serve God and he wants to obey God. And we see that great change because verse 15 tells us that after he was healed, he returned to the man of God with all his company and now he stood before 
Elisha. No more still waiting for Elisha to come to him. He stood before Elisha and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Now he addressed himself as the servant of the servant of God. He had humbled himself before God. And, he's, and of course, name, uh, Elisha said, No, uh, I will not take anything. Even with Naaman's urging, please take, take some reward. He said, no. And so Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servants, again, two mules burden of earth. He wanted to take two, two carts drawn by the mules, by the donkeys of earth, back to Syria, probably to build an altar in order to worship God, because he said, For thy servants will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto Jehovah God. So now, before he was saying, I thought this, uh, this uh, Elisha will come out and call upon his God, but now this God is also his, Naaman's own God, that he wants to worship and give his life to. Dear friends, every human being is like Naaman. We have a very serious problem that will not only kill us in this life, but kill us in the life to come, that forever we will die in hell's punishment. And that problem is sin. Without exception, all of us have sinned against God. We have not obeyed God. We have, as the Bible says, come short of the glory of God. Sin has to do with the breaking of law, the breaking of God's law. We may not be criminals here in, in, in this life. We may not break any laws of the land, but we have all broken God's law. And that is sin. And God will judge us for that. And you may ask, why must I obey God? Well, you and I live in God's world. You and I receive the light, the sunshine, breath and health and everything from God. Just like we read in the passage just now, at the beginning we were told that even Naaman's successes in war was given by God. And do you think that that little girl who served as his mate, his wife's mate, was there by chance? It was God's arrangement. And do you think that it was not God who sent Elisha to, to tell the king, don't be afraid, bring him to me. And do you not think that it is God who gave Naaman those good men who followed him to tell him, please listen, listen to the prophet of God and you will be healed. If not for all this intervention, gracious intervention of God, Naaman would have gone back to continue to rot till he die. But because of God, he, come, he comes to, to have that healing. This really, we are to acknowledge that we need to obey God or else we sin. To ask, why must I obey God? It's just like a child asking, why must I obey my parents? Or a citizen asking, why must I obey the laws of the land? Well, if you are a child, you ought to obey your parents. If you are a citizen of Singapore, you ought to obey the laws. Or else you just wait to be, be punished rightly for breaking the laws. And we live in God's world. We must obey God. Failure to keep God's law is serious. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that's why we die. And dying doesn't end with nothingness. We don't die and become nothing. Our souls continue to live and we will be punished for our sins. The wages of sin is death, eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the good news. That's the good news that our leprous sin, our sin that is like leprosy, can be healed. 
And Romans 1.16 says, The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Every sinner needs this same remedy. That is, we need the atoning death, the atoning, the payment of the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins so that God can spare us from the punishment. When you, by faith, come to the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that He is the Saviour that God has sent to die on your behalf, to pay for your sins, then you can be sure that you will be washed clean from your sins because Jesus has paid for your sins in full. may sound ridiculous to you, like how Naaman, when he heard the solution, but this is indeed declared in the Word of God. It's not invented by Christians, invented by the, word, by, by, by the church, but it is revealed to us by God. So until someone is willing to surrender himself unconditionally to his Creator God and plead for his mercy, he will still be like a leper waiting to die not only in this life, but in the life to come. What must I do to be saved? What about you, dear friend? You and I can come to the Saviour. Come even this moment. Don't wait any longer. Come even right now to God and pray to Him, acknowledging that God, I now see that I have never obeyed your law. I have sinned against you. I deserve to die. I deserve to be punished. But please heal me of this leprosy, of this sin. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus that is shed to, for the payment of sins. I believe. My faith may be weak. God, help me. Help me to know more about this Saviour. I want to give my life to Him. And when you do come in sincere repentance to God, when you do come in sincere giving of yourself to God to want to follow Him from now onwards like Naaman, from now onwards I will worship God, then you can be sure you will be forgiven by God and you will be received by God. So, our prayer for you, dear friends, the reason why we so earnestly invite and hope you come and we're thankful, we're glad that you come, is that you will come to know this salvation that is in Christ. Don't walk away like Naaman initially one wanted. Don't walk away because you think that this is not the way you thought a man should be saved. Trust in the word of God and you shall be saved. The cost is too great to forfeit. Like the Lord Jesus said, what is man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? When you come to the point of death, what can you give to exchange for life? Can you tell the doctor, Doctor, I give you all that I have. Please extend my life. You can't. When you come before God's judgment seat, God, I give you all that I have. Please let me into heaven. You can't. What can you give in exchange for your soul, the Lord Jesus said. Yes, you might think that if I become a Christian, I may have to forfeit a lot of things. I give up myself. I, I'm now to follow Christ. But it's not burdensome. When I say, what can you give in exchange for life? It's not just about living forever. It's about living the true purpose of life that God has created man to live. What would you give in order for you to have true happiness, true joy as a human being, to live the way God has made us to live, to live a purposeful, meaningful life in God? 
what can you give? No, you just need to come by faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All the enjoyments of this world are temporal. What is 60, 70, 80 years of enjoyment compared to eternal glory or eternal suffering? What would you give in exchange for life? God is gracious. As I said, God graciously intervened in Naaman's life. And I pray that God would intervene today also in your life. That it is not by chance that you have come here. It is by God's appointment that you have come. And may God work in your heart so that you will humbly acknowledge that you need Jesus to be the Savior and that you will come to Him by faith and from this day forward follow him so that you know you will be healed of your eternal death you will be healed of sin's curse on your life but then you will receive God's eternal blessing may God be gracious to each and every one of us and even for us as Christians we still continue to find weaknesses in ourselves and we sin don't we we also constantly need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ to ask for cleansing it's not just a one-time thing we continue to go to Christ and ask Lord I believe that it is only in you that I can find forgiveness so when you see sin in your life go to Christ it's good it's good that God show us our sins but let us, with that insight, go to Christ and not stop there. Find our joy, find our hope in Christ so that we will forever live for His glory. Amen.